So Pentecost is for us a celebration of the work of the Holy Spirit. We read this story of the mighty wind, and we wear clothes, the color of the fire that danced over the apostles' heads. And we celebrate the day that the church was born out of this locked room where they'd been meeting privately and began declaring to the world that Christ is risen. But did you notice that those first disciples were already there gathered to celebrate Pentecost? Something tells me that our holiday isn't the one they were observing. They weren't celebrating the day that the Holy Spirit threw them out of the locked room, right? The word Pentecost comes from the Greek word for 50. In Hebrew, the festival is called Shavuot, or the Festival of Weeks. It's a festival that occurs 50 days, or a week of weeks, as it were, after the Passover. It was a harvest festival. It celebrates the first fruits of the grain harvest coming in from the fields. But the timing is significant because it also coincides with the day that Moses supposedly brought the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai. So let's think about that for a moment. Here we have a harvest festival combined with a festival celebrating the giving of the law. What on earth do those two things have in common? Remember that before going to Sinai, the Israelites had to travel 40 days in the wilderness with no food or water. It was during that time that God began feeding them with manna, gave them water from the rock. Every time they faced a new challenge, you all might also remember that those same Israelites complained against Moses. They asked why he had brought them in the desert to die. They said, is it because there were not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? They were convinced that they were doomed. In fact, they were so convinced that less than a month after leaving slavery behind, they were looking back at Egypt as the good old days. Oh, remember when we ate our fill of the onions and the leeks and the melons, they asked, and the flesh pots. Oh, the flesh pots. Why had they ever left Egypt when they'd had it so good? Sure, there was some light forced labor, but really, was it all that bad? Now, that seems ridiculous to us reading it now, and it's meant to sound ridiculous. But can you imagine what must have made them feel that way? Can you imagine how frightened they must have been to be able to look back on generations of slavery and oppression with nostalgia? At least in Egypt, they knew they would be fed and cared for, but out here in the wilderness where they were headed, they had no such guarantees. And that's, so, that's exactly what this festival celebrates. A guarantee. The giving of the law was a sign that God hadn't brought them into the wilderness to die. That God had long-term plans for these folks. That this was the beginning of something bigger. The law says that this is just the first page of a much longer story. The beginning of a new nation. Pentecost, or Shavuot, is the celebration of God's faithfulness, the same faithfulness we see when just a few seeds bring an abundant harvest. This is God's promise for Israel coming to fruition. That's what we're celebrating. So then let's put that in context. These first disciples are gathered to celebrate Pentecost, the festival of God's faithfulness. And where the story picks up, I wonder if maybe they were just as afraid as the Israelites in the desert. I wonder if with Jesus gone, they felt like they didn't even have a Moses to follow. It seems appropriate then that on this day of remembering God's faithfulness, they should also see God show up spectacularly and remind them that they are not alone, just like God showed up on Sinai. Remind them that God is still with them. That like those humble beginnings in the wilderness, this is the first page of a much longer story. Just the beginning of something greater. And so I wonder if a good question for us to ponder today is, what is that something greater? In the wilderness, it was a nation coming to birth. But what's coming to birth on this Pentecost? This new and kind of odd Pentecost? 
According to St. Luke's story, whatever it is, is bigger than simply a new nation or a new ethnic group. Through these first disciples, now apostles, God is bringing people together across the boundaries of race and language and nationality. And even though the people in today's story are all Jews, we will soon follow the story of Acts as even non-Jews are brought into this new thing that God is doing. And so I wonder if that's not the primary message of Pentecost. That as Jesus tells his disciples after the Last Supper, I will not leave you orphaned. That God is still with us. And I think that's important news because sometimes it feels pretty lonely out there in the world, doesn't it? Sometimes it feels like there's just so much darkness and pain and uncertainty that we don't stand a chance. We wonder what can we possibly do? I'm especially thinking this week of the hatred and the violence we've just witnessed in Buffalo and in Uvalde and Tulsa. Sometimes it feels like we're standing on the edge of the wilderness, staring out into this vast nothing and being told, that's where we're headed. What's interesting to me today is not just that God shows up on Pentecost, but how God shows up. This small handful of Galileans experiences something incredible. Something that drives them out into the streets to begin proclaiming good news. And that message is so powerful that it transcends all those things that divide us. Things like race and class and ethnicity and nationality and language. Language, even. The Holy Spirit somehow makes it possible for these people who don't even speak the same language to connect with one another in ways that were otherwise impossible. And if we read through to the end of the story, we find that some 3,000 people joined the community that day. Remember, they started with 120. This is an order of magnitude increase. 3,000 people joined the community that day. 3,000 Parthians and Medes and Elamites Macedonians and Judeans and Cappadocians and Pontians and Asians and Phrygians and Pamphylians and Egyptians and Libyans and Cretans and Arabs. God comes to this small, scared community, not just in tongues of fire, but in this giant, multinational, multi ethnic crowd of folks, all excited to hear and to share that good news to share their resources with one another and support each other. They become what St. Paul calls the body of Christ. Jesus has left, and he's also showed up again. And I think about that as I read from St. John's Gospel account today, and I hear Jesus describing how even as he's leaving his friends, he's also coming to them. He can't seem to make up his mind which way he's headed. As he describes how he is in the Father and the Father is in him, and also how he is in them, and they are in him. It's easy to get lost in these circular rhythms of Jesus' words in this chapter, but it all kind of boils down to this. Those who love me will keep my commandments, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them, and we will make our home with them. That admonition to keep my commandments might sound kind of legalistic, but remember what Jesus' commandment is, right? To love one another as I have loved you. That word commandment in Greek is the same word that refers to the commandments of the law handed down to Moses on Sinai. That thing that we're celebrating at Pentecost. But that word in Hebrew is Torah, which means commandment or law, sure, but it also means teaching or wisdom, or sage advice, or underlying logic. And so I wonder if Jesus is saying here that love, love for one another such as he has for us, if love is not just a good rule of thumb, it's also the basic pattern of reality. 
the blueprint of creation and the guarantee of what God has in store. Just like that law given to Moses on Sinai on Pentecost. When we love, God is at home with us and we are at home with God. What I hear in this passage is that wherever there is love, God abides with us. That's one of St. John's favorite words, abides. God abides with us and we abide with God. Love in the face of terror or pain or abuse or oppression is challenging. It doesn't always look like we expect. Sometimes love is speaking truth to power. Sometimes love is extending grace and forgiveness. Sometimes it's caring enough to walk away. But all love is born from the same truth, the truth that God abides in us and that in God, all are one. That's the truth to which St. Luke bears witness in this story in Acts, that all these different groups of people separated by language and geography, they are all one in Christ. And this oneness, this spirit of adoption, as Paul calls it, invites us forward into the wilderness, not backward, not back to the flesh pots. It beckons us into what we do not understand or see, and it invites us to hope in something greater, something else that is just beginning to come to birth. We may not understand it, but when we call upon God as Abba, as father and mother, this spirit of adoption, this spirit of God calls out with and to the spirit of God abiding within each of us and testifies to this truth that's beyond our ability to understand or comprehend. It groans within us drawing us mysteriously forward to this home that God has prepared for us. This home in which God abides in us and we abide in God and we all abide in one another. It's easy, at least for me, to read this story from Acts today and wish we could go back to that, right? That simple, idealistic time when everybody held everything in common and there was perfect harmony. But I wonder if that impulse to turn backward to what was so good is the same impulse that tempted the Israelites to return to the flesh pots of Egypt. I wonder if instead of looking backward, the Spirit of God invites us to look forward to our salvation. Not to the garden before the fall or to that first Pentecost, but to the end of all things. When all creation is finally healed and reconciled to itself and to God, and that mysterious oneness is finally realized. The spirit that God gives us pulls us ahead into the unknown, fills us with hope for a harvest that is not yet realized. That spirit is not satisfied with what's easy or ideal, but instead challenge us to move and grow and change maybe even to die and be reborn. And so I ask myself today, what does that spirit of adoption, that spirit of unity, ask me to do now? Where is that spirit calling me? Can I love and abide with people such as this now? What does that love look like? How can I hope to abide with people who have no interest in abiding with me? I don't know the answers to these questions, but I am convinced that whatever that answer is, it lies in Jesus, who abides with us and we in him, and he and us in the Father. Every day, I am more and more convinced that the salvation God has in mind for us and for all creation is the healing of all things. Healing such as I cannot fully imagine. Healing that makes everything one. And the only evidence I have for this is Jesus himself. 
Jesus, who gives himself to those who hate him, who lays down his life for his friends, who loves to the end, and because he loves to the end, loves without end. I am convinced that somehow he's right. This is the way. This is the truth. This is the life.